I can do anything I want to you people at any time I want to, because that's what you've done to me. If you are an armchair detective, you may enjoy stories of true crime. One of its particularly gruesome subcategories is serial criminals. Some reporters use serial criminal interviews to get a glimpse into the twisted minds and lives of these notorious maniacs. Here are five of those creepiest interviews ever. Number 5. Ted Bundy Interview Just hours before he was electrocuted in the electric chair for physically hurting and taking the life of nearly 50 women, the serial criminal Ted Bundy gave an official interview. He had never really spoken out during the 10 years he was incarcerated. Bundy reminisced about his seemingly normal childhood. He shared that his parents were good Christian people who worked hard and loved their children. The Bundy family attended church each Sunday and were active in their church and community, he said. Bundy said that his parents encouraged him in school and were always supportive. The only dark spot in his life became his urge to take lives. Bundy said it was an obsession that was brought on by his addiction to indecent videos on the internet. He said that he read numerous studies and had talked to other criminals concerning the correlation between such content and violence. His voice was steady, and he spoke as a well-educated person. His interview shed more light on the reasons why some people get hooked on such a life of crime. What do we have here, Ken? Let's see. Oh, it's an indictment, all right? Why don't you read it to me? You're on bail for election, aren't you? Oh, you're going to get it. Let's read it. Let's go. Theodore Robert Bundy, you are charged, indictment, design, or intent to affect the death of said Lisa Lee. My chance to talk to the press. I got you. I'll plead not guilty right now. And your grand... Number four, Jeffrey Dahmer's interview. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most notorious serial criminals in modern history. Not only did he take the lives of his unsuspecting victims, but he also systematically dismembered them and kept their body parts as grisly mementos. He also had admitted to committing acts of necrophilia and cannibalism. This was an interview conducted by Nancy Glass of Inside Edition. Dahmer recollected the time that he led another young gay man to a hotel and drugged him. According to Dahmer, he just wanted to have a kinky physical encounter. Instead, he woke up and the other guy had been beaten to his final breath. This was Dahmer's first act of taking a life. In his own words, Jeffrey Dahmer told Glass how he was always fascinated with dead things and taking out their entrails. As a disturbed young man, Dahmer said that he became addicted to violent and indecent videos. Pretty soon, the make-believe magazines were not enough. He wanted to experience the taking of lives and dismemberment for real. As far as the mummified body parts were concerned, Dahmer told Glass that it was his way of reliving the horrid details and keeping the victims close to him. It was in no way an act of vengeance or anger, explained Dahmer. Not long after the Inside Edition interview, Jeffrey Dahmer was bludgeoned to well-deserved end by a fellow inmate in prison. Right. Not because I was angry with them, not because I hated them, but because I wanted to keep them with me, control them to, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, he was saving body parts such as uh, skulls and uh, skeletons. Number 3. Charles Manson Interview The flowery summer of 1969 ended with a spree of lives ended in the Hollywood area. A self-proclaimed messiah of evil named Charles Manson claimed that these crimes would spawn a race war that he called Helter Skelter. After Manson and his clan were finished, several notable people were slain, including the pregnant actress Sharon Tate and the coffee heiress Abigail Folger. When the Today Show interviewed Manson from San Quentin Prison, Manson had lucid moments mixed with rage and mad confusion. The pivotal question posed to Manson was if he had any remorse for the lives he ordered to be taken. As in past interviews, Manson totally laughed it off and said that he could not feel guilty for something he did not do. The only regrets he had, said Manson, was that he did not take the lives of even more people. He thought this would be his contribution to society. This is the most recent interview with serial criminal Manson. Currently, Charles Manson is serving life in prison without hope of parole. He is said to be in poor health and still shows no care or remorse for the horrible crimes that were done in his name. I can do anything I want to you people at any time I want to, because that's what you've done to me. He never heard you express remorse. Have you never felt it? Your words, as Mr. Emmons quotes them in this book, it's clear that you were guilty. Remorse for what? You people have done everything in the world to me. Doesn't that give me equal right? If you spit in my face and smack me in the mouth and throw me in solitary confinement for nothing, what do you think's going to happen when I get out of here? Number two, David Berkowitz, son of Sam Interview. David Berkowitz looks like your average middle-aged schlubby goofball. You probably wouldn't guess, context aside, that he's serving six consecutive life sentences in prison for taking the lives of six people, not to mention the wounding of several others, between the years of 1976 and 1977. And yet, here we are. 
Berkowitz was captured in 1977 as he was allegedly en route to committing another crime of the same nature. Interviews with various psychologists revealed that he likely was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia and that he believed himself to be a part of a satanic cult under direct orders from the devil. He had subbed himself the son of Sam, referring to a dog, Harvey, owned by his neighbor, Sam Carr. Berkowitz thought the dog was possessed by a demon who had instructed him towards the gruelsome acts. Though obviously Berkowitz was experiencing delusions, some law enforcement experts have theorized that there may have been other Satanists who had committed some of the Son of Sam crimes. Berkowitz confessed, but some of the Son of Sam shootings remain open cases. In this interview, Berkowitz recounts his past contract with the devil and Satanic rituals, claiming that they are all entirely behind him. He insists that he is a changed person, saying, My job was to be a soldier for the devil and to bring destruction. Ultimately, that good would become of it, and that would help bring about the apocalypse, the end of the world, so God would establish his kingdom of peace. Today, Berkowitz is still alive and resides in Sullivan Correctional Facility in Fallsburg, New York. He claims to be a born-again Christian and even maintains his own website through a third-party source as he notes that he is not allowed access to a computer. In 2006, Berkowitz released a memoir titled Son of Hope, The Prison Journals of David Berkowitz. He claims he receives no money. I make a big deal of it. I just consider it as part of my life now, part of, in a sense, part of my ministry. Uh, I get letters from people from all walks of life. He's doing fine. But he asked me not to talk about it. I understand. That's what safeguard his privacy and privacy of his family. It's been a lot. It's been a lot. Uh, I don't make a big deal of it. Number one, John Wayne Gacy interview. Convicted of physically attacking and taking the lives of 33 men and teenage boys between 1972 and 1978, John Wayne Gacy was also known by his daytime career pseudonym of Pogo the Clown. Wayne was a father, a husband, a businessman, and an active, well-liked member of the local community. That is, until 26 corpses were found buried in the crawl space of his home in Chicago, Illinois. The rest of his victims were buried elsewhere on his property or discarded in a nearby river. Gacy, a determined sociopath, claimed to have no remorse for his crimes and until the end of his life remained in complete denial about them. In this clip, Gacy becomes confused by his own tangled web of lies and in his determined attempt to keep his story straight, he makes a crucial slip-up that was now captured for posterity. Keep watching to see Gacy try to cover up his blunder by telling the interviewer, Oh, okay, I'm sorry if I led you to believe that. Strike it then, that is wrong. He's visibly seen realizing his mistake when the interviewer, Walter Jacobson, informs him of his slip-up. Though he can probably strike out his own memories or truths for his own advantage, the memory and permanence of film does not change and Gacy was ultimately executed on orders of the Supreme Court by lethal injection. Yeah, right. Are you afraid sitting that close to me? What the hell? Oh, this is too long. I you don't need it this long. I had a rosary, which I carried in my pocket. I've always carried a rosary. It was my communion... I, I says, uh, depending on what I'm using it for, I said, the only thing I ever learned was from Boy Scouts is a tourniquet knot. He said, and I said, well, here, you, you put it around. This is hard trying to do this. Why don't you put your hand out? Oh, you just turn this. And I says, it causes a tourniquet. I said, that's the only knot I ever learned. That's all for this video, folks. See you another time.